pacing back and forth trying to get the courage to come out in front of all of you. Um, and I speak to 100,000 people a year. What happened for me was I grew up in a physically, a physical and verbal abusive family. Ever since I was probably seven or eight years old, I was shut down in terms of sharing my feelings. And I was always told that it was weak, it was wrong, it was unmanly to be able to share my feelings. And I would have given anything I never, was never able to tell my mother or my father or my brother that I loved him, never once. And I would have given anything to get close to my father. I just didn't know how to do it. And he was one of these people that kept a distance. He was he built up walls between us. And there was no opportunity to be able to open up. And so I stuffed it. I kept stuffing it and stuffing it and stuffing my feelings. And there was no room. There was no place. And he insisted on achievement. See, love was given out in my family based on performance. And so I became a seven-letter athlete in high school. I was president of my class two years running. I carried an A-minus average, and I also tried to kill myself three times. Three times, because I was living off the image. I was so afraid that if something happened, if I got hurt on the football field, or if I didn't perform, and when the smoke cleared, there would be no one there for me. And I spent my whole life looking at this and looking at performance and love in the same vein, in the same vein. About four years ago, I was speaking at a school in Dearborn, and somebody pulled me off to the side and said, Jim, you got some major problems. Better deal with them. It sounds really serious. Turned out my father had had a series of heart attacks. I don't even remember finishing that program, but what I do remember was getting on the first plane, flying into New York, getting to the hospital several hours later, and walking in the hospital room and seeing my father for the first time vulnerable in my life. He was laid out in a coma, intravenous bottles coming out and tubes sticking out all over. And my first instinct with this was that I grabbed, pulled a chair over and I grabbed his hands and I wanted at that moment, I had never been able to do it, I wanted at that moment to tell this man I loved him. I wanted to tell him he was special. I wanted to tell him that he had made some sort of a difference in my life. His life was hanging by a thread. And I couldn't do it. Old tapes kept playing in my head. Back, it's not safe, I can't open up. I can't, I can't, I can't. 
I sat in that hospital room for two days, day and night, in the chair, just getting up occasionally just to go and eat something. But I slept in that hospital room. And my father moved in and out of a coma maybe half a dozen times for maybe a minute or two, sometimes a little bit longer. And each time there was another opportunity. And each time, each time, same stuff kept playing through my mind. And every time he'd open up his eyes, instead of saying, Dad, I love you, what I would say was, Dad, do you need anything? Do you want me to get the nurse? Do you need a glass of water? When in my gut, what I wanted to say was what I was feeling. Two days I stayed in that hospital room. My father survived the heart attacks. There were three in succession. To this day, most of us in the family were really unclear about how that happened, but we just attribute it to the strength of the man. About a month later, I got essentially a second chance to tell him that I cared. I had a speaking engagement in New York City, and I called him up, and I said, Dad, let's get together for dinner, you and I. Just you and I, I've got something really important to tell you. Well, he had just gotten out of the hospital, and he gave me the perfect out. He said, Jim, he says, I've got dinner plans. He says, what about lunch? Well, I had a fly-in in the morning, and I had a program to do. I had television commitments. I had meetings. I had all kinds of things sandwiched, and I was flying out that night. I want to tell all of you in the room, I rearranged my entire schedule to get to that restaurant to tell my father for the first time that I loved him. And I got to that restaurant a half an hour early and I was doing all these mind games. What's going to make him not put me down? What's going to make him not hurt me? What's going to make him not be silent? What's going to make him not laugh? All the things that I had lived with when I was a kid. And I was sitting in that restaurant doing the mind games, trying to plan a strategy, trying to get the words when I couldn't control myself anymore, I just got up and I started pacing and then I walked outside. I figured I'd take a walk around the block, just get my courage up. And I lost track of time. I looked over at one of the buildings and there was a big, big clock on one of the buildings and I realized I was 15 minutes late. And what I realized was that my father runs his whole life by the clock and I was panicked and I raced back into that restaurant. And sure enough, he was sitting there waiting for me. And the first thing this, this man did was jam me. He says, why are you 15 minutes late? He says, you know I've only got an hour for lunch. He says, when are you going to be on time? And I looked at this guy and I said, no way. No way. I cannot be hurt anymore. I cannot. Except I looked over at my father. Looked at him. And if you've ever seen death in somebody's face, that's what I saw in his face that day. I realized that there was probably no third chance on this. He had lost 50 pounds since the heart attacks. He had no color in his face. And I knew there probably would be no, not another opportunity to be able to do it. And so I grabbed his hands again. And I said, Dad, thanks for waiting up till 2 o'clock in the morning when I didn't show up all night. Thanks for standing by me when I tore the cartilage in my knee and I couldn't finish the last three football games. Thanks for bailing me out, Dad. I really love you. And as I said, I really love you to this man, I put my head down because I was so frightened of what the reaction was going to be. I didn't even want him to hear me. I was hoping he didn't. But he did. And I raised my head, and it was the last thing in the world that I could imagine. I looked at my father, and for the first time in my life, first time in my life, I never saw it at my grandfather's funeral. The first time in my life, I watched my father cry. And all the stuff that had been sitting inside of me, I just let go. Just let go. And I reached over and I held this man. I held him. I could tell all of you in the room, because it was a struggle for me all of my life, I could tell all of you in the room without any embarrassment that for me that ranks at the top, the top of the best moments I've ever had in my life, ever had. Now I got together with my father the next morning for breakfast. And he told me something that blew me away. He said, Jim, he said, I would have gone to my grave and not been able to tell you that I loved you. He said, because my grandfather, he said, my father, my grandfather told him that it was wrong. He was just passing that one on. 
He was just passing that one on. I speak to 100,000 kids a year. And what I watch is the tremendous dysfunction that is created from parent to child, and then child becomes a parent, and it's back to the child again. And it's this chain reaction that scares me out there. It scares me. I go all over the country trying to get educators and parents and in particular kids to tell each other what they want and need. Because sometimes we guess. See, we adults guess. And many times we guess wrong. It's my hope that some of us guess right in kids' lives. And therefore, we can make a major difference. About a year ago, I took a young boy who was living in his car. I spoke at an alternative school in Kalamazoo, and I met this young boy four years ago, reacquainted myself with him when I spoke at the school again. He'd been living in his car at that time for about six or seven months. He came to live with me, lived with me for about a year, and probably gave me more insight because of the tremendous dysfunction he was living under. By the way, he was, uh, at the time that I took him in, he was 17, and he had a three-year-old daughter at that time. Um, he taught me more about the tremendous dysfunction that's out there than probably any person to date has been able to give me in terms of insight, because he was a living example, and he lived this every day. I took him to a youth conference, and as they were introducing all the panel, uh, this boy was sitting there. When it came time for his introduction and for him to say a few words, he picked on somebody in the front row. And he said, and I'd like to recreate this. Sir, tell me what you see. OK. This is the question he asked of, of somebody in the front row. And then he said to that person, he said, you're a liar. He says, this is what I see. He said, until you adults can see what it is that us kids see, he says, you'll never, ever make a difference in our lives. And I believe that in my heart. I believe that. I spoke in New York City um, last spring. And during my program, which is a whole school program, a teacher got up in front of the whole school. And she said, she said, I'm an English teacher. She said, a year ago, I gave my class an assignment to compare themselves to an inanimate object. She said, the most popular kid in school handed in a paper. Um, now, the assignment was compare yourself to an inanimate object and then tell what that object is like and you know how you feel as that object. This boy, as I said, was the most popular kid in school. He was Mr. Everything. And this is the paper that he handed in. I am a rubber band. People pull at me, twist me, and stretch me thin. I've been trying to bounce back as a rubber band should. I have many times, but it's getting harder and harder, and I'm getting thin and worn. People keep pulling at me, twisting and stretching me and I feel tighter and tighter. I know when I break, people will feel sorry because they can't use me anymore. But they stretch me and stretch me, and I feel thin and worn. Then I'll break, but it'll be too late. Can I ask any of you in the room, as a teacher, what would you do if you got a paper like this? I'm not gonna tell you the outcome of this but what would you do if you got a paper like this? Considering the source, the most popular kid in school, <clears throat> considering the fact that this individual, anyone? Well, I would talk to him first. Okay. First of all, can I, can I back up just, just a small step on this? Would you take this seriously? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> all right, working off of that premise. What would you do? I would talk to him. I okay. would say, you know, 
what's happening in your life that's making you feel so special? Okay. What, what do you have control over? You? Can we do some role play? Why don't I become the, the boy? I don't want to put you on the spot. Why don't you just, you know. <laughs> these are some skills that are sure. crucial. I mean, I have to I have to be honest with all of you. No one. I spoke at my at my commencement here, uh, commencement exercises at my high school, and I talked to everybody. I told them that I had tried to take my own life three times. Now there were teachers and principals and coaches and everybody who came back to hear me speak, and they came up to me afterwards and they were amazed. They were amazed that, you know, they said, we used to sit in the teacher's lounge and if we thought anybody had it all, it was you. And inside, I was screaming for help. Screaming for help. Okay. You want me to be the teacher and you be the kid? Please. Can I look at the paper? You can, of course. <clears throat> all right. Well, I guess I would say Boy, I got this paper from you, and I see that you're feeling pretty torn apart. You know, there's stuff, must be stuff in your life that's causing this. What can I do to help you? Nothing. Well, if I can, is there anybody that you think that you and I could get a hold of that maybe could help you work some of this through? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> no. Um, is there anything in this that you've told me that you think you have some control over, that you can do something that could bring about some change? It's just an exercise. I'm not, don't. You're not really like this? Don't, don't even, that's, that's, that's garbage. Don't, don't even worry about it. Well, I know that when I was young and I was your age that I had these feelings. In fact, you know, I know spring chicken and I still have these feelings all the time. Watch the spring chicken. I saw that. <laughs> um, and I know that I have these feelings too. And when I have them, Sometimes I know what to do and sometimes I don't, but I do know that if you keep it all inside, that it's not going to go away. Wait a minute, do you have these feelings? Yeah, I have them all the time. Really? Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, I can't believe like, that. You really have the feelings? Yeah, see, you come in my room and you think, you know, that I'm, I'm a pretty good teacher and I seem to be up most of the time, but you know, how do you know that I haven't just uh, had a terrible fight with my husband or that my uh, son hasn't been in a car accident on M59 to refer back to some of the things we've all shared in our building? Um, sure, I think everybody at one time or another feels like this. Can we, can we, uh, I, I, want, I want you to hold this for a second, because uh, there was a crucial turn in this, and I'm, I'm curious what the crucial turn was for any of you. Sure, sure. Hmm? She became, she became vulnerable, a little bit vulnerable, a little bit real. What did that permit me to do? If, if she had stood her ground and became clinical, what would have happened then? Mm -hmm. I would have shut her down. Absolutely. Absolutely. Continue. Well, where was I? M59. Ah, yes. I was on M59. Um, you know, I think that a lot of people go through life thinking that they're the only ones that ever have bad feelings about themselves, about their life in general, but the truth is that everybody does. Even people that look like they're totally together are not always totally together. And then, you know, I'm not going to go into the whole thing because these guys all know, but I would then start citing examples from my life of what has happened to me in ways that I got around or overcame or functioned in spite of. That's what I would do, but you don't want me to take your valuable time. And <laughs> my evil stepfather. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to go through. That, that would be what I would do, though. Okay, um, that's great. Let's let's suppose that now I, we built up a trust, you and I, and let's let's suppose now that we have some some measure of trust, 20, 25 percent trust. Continue on with a progression of what you would do in terms of the relationship with me. How's everything going today? I'm having a really tough time at home. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm, I cannot, cannot seem to do anything good enough. You mean like you try to do something where you think your parents are going to be really pleased and they only spot what you didn't do? Or... 
I can't, no matter what I do, no matter how much I try, it's just not enough. And every time I get to this point and, you know, I get shot down, what do I need to do? Tell me, what do I need to do to make them love me? I would bet that they love you, but don't know how to show you that they love you. But I think that you're going to have to, you're going to have to do this, because you can't change them. You can only change the way you react to them. And I, I react fine to them. Maybe you need to tell them how you feel. I can't. I can't. What, what's the worst thing that will happen to you if you tell them this? Are you kidding? They'll put me down more. How can they put you down more? You're already telling me you're stretched and worn and thin and you're going to break. How can they put you down more? I just wrote that at a down moment. Ah, well, you mean you're not down right now. Now you feel great, right? Well, I don't feel great, but I, I just wrote that at a down moment. It would seem to me that you're going to have to talk to them. You're going to have to open communication. I'll tell you what. Would you feel comfortable if I called them and talked to them and expressed some of my concerns, knowing how you feel, and asked for a meeting? I don't know. I just, I'm scared. Sure, of course you're scared. Who isn't scared? Of course you are. But I can't see that going on this way is going to make a difference. You have to do something that changes the pattern of the way it's going. Yeah, but they're going to come in and they're going to, and you know, and it may be great in the room, and then when I get home, they're gonna, they just, they're gonna kill me again. Oh, sure, that's a risk. That is a risk. But there's also a risk that maybe they're gonna take a look at themselves and say, whoa, this kid is really upset. Jim, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. and they're gonna say, hey, you know, maybe Jim is seriously concerned. Maybe we gotta do something. You don't know that they're not going to, do you? No. But, you know, I, I gotta be honest with you. I just don't trust him. I don't trust them. Do they trust you? Gotta ask them because I don't know. I mean, I just, I'm there. I do, I do the best that I can. I give them my best. Why do I feel like I'm still teaching school? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know what I, I, you know, I don't know because I don't think you can role play it in a one shot deal because you would know far more about the student than just this or just. Do you know what I'm saying? Can I, I, I just want to challenge all of you on this a little bit, and I'll, I'll give you something a, a little bit premature than before I would normally not do it. Can anyone tell me what you perceive the outcome of this? Of, of the paper itself? Yeah, of the, of the situation of, of the paper, of, of the teacher's involvement. I would think that Sheila, as a teacher, would have done some homework meeting with you, and she would have probably found out some teachers that you had before she'd ask questions, which is what she would normally do, mm -hmm. and, and she would bounce ideas off of people, and like when we have a, a kid that's presenting this sort of thing, we usually, by this point in time, we've checked out what's going on at home with a single parent if there's a significant other in this person's life. And we, we do some background information, and that's what Sheila cannot role play for you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have any prior knowledge of you other than, in fact, what you read on your sheet that you can pick up. Well, no, I mentioned, you know, a little bit of history, that right. I was Mr. Right. Everything in school. Right. And that I was popular, and that I had a ton of friends. And but wait, is that you, or is that, oh, you mean this kid that, you're saying this paper too. It's the same deal. The it's popular, the cool, the with it. This kid is is, is Mr. Okay. Popular. This kid is Mr. Everything. This kid is is you know uh, the athlete. You know the whole thing. This kid is that. Which impresses the student body more than it impresses the faculty, don't you think? Because I mean, we look at a lot of kids that seemingly are very together, but that we know that they have mm -hmm. underlying so things that we know about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Given the history that I just gave you, um, with the Mr. Everything on that, what do you perceive the outcome of this was? Well, I, I, I would think that it was also good. I would feel You're struggling. <laughs> Ignore this 
one thing and see all the good things. Mm -hmm. So, although that is you know, the wrong thing to do, I would just like to have because we're human too. We've got a lot of things to work with. And this kid is not, this kid is functioning great. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we have to work So I would just like to feel the same effect. <coughs> You guys are blessed with this. If you have a true support system in this school, I have to tell you that, that you're blessed. I speak at, you know, 100 schools a year. and. I rarely ever see the levels of support for us. Well, we're very blessed in our school. We're blessed. We all support each other. We all I mean, that's here. that's what I'm talking about. Not yeah. necessarily adjunct support staff, but a supportive environment. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I had this situation happen with me with a student that I taught at a different school. And I had gone and talked to our support. And the girl had given me permission to go ahead and talk to one person. And they brought in a social worker and, and another gal. And, and they made a mistake and they went and talked to the girl first. Mm -hmm. And it killed the whole thing. The whole process just stopped. But I lost all the accountability with her. And I got it back to a point, but she'd never go back in and mm -hmm. talk to her. Good point. I mean, these are these are issues, and I, I would hope that long after I come and go, I, these are issues to really struggle with because I. Um, anyone else? What, what do you perceive? Yes. I would think that a kid like this um, would need the support that no matter what they did, that somebody liked them. So as a teacher, I would, you know, let the kid know, hey, it's okay to fail a couple times in my class. I still like you. I think you're a great person. Even though you've done a couple things in my class, I still think you're a great person. I think a kid like that needs support that you will still like them even though they do something wrong. Even though they're not the best at the top of the class, that you, you know, still like them. Great. This kid was the top of the class. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, from the sounds of it, it was, um, he was doing so many things for everybody else, I probably would have asked what would make him happy. Is he doing mm -hmm. this for himself or is he doing it for somebody else? Great. Mm -hmm. That's, I would probably approach that. Okay. Anyone else? What do you, what do you perceive? Back to what do you perceive as the outcome? I I haven't think, you? I'm going to tell you one thing. I would also check parents as far as substance abuse and see if he is the overachiever trying to please mm -hmm. the hero Mom or dad, the hero child, child. Yeah. exactly, the one that's trying to pull things all together because it sounds to me like he's not happy doing all the things that he has to feels like he has to do. And oftentimes kids are motivated if they hear a child. And I would check at home to see what's going on. And I would never think let the kid think I'd given up on him. Every day I would say hello, I would say how you doing? You wanna drop by? What's up? That's a great skill. I'm I'm trying to teach parents and educators a concept that I've developed called a 30-second counseling session. And I want to take a break for, for a second, and, and, I, and I'll give you the outcome in a minute of this. The 30-second counseling session is anybody can do it. If you see a kid, if you see an adult, if you see somebody in your life that looks down and they've got a problem, then ask them, you know, what's going on? Looks like you're not, you know, it's not working for you. If at that moment the person is willing to trust you and say, you know, for instance, if it was a kid and the kid's name is Johnny and, you know, you say, Johnny, what's going on? Looks, looks like you're down. And Johnny says, you know, nothing's going right. I'm having some major problems with my father. Now, you can say to Johnny, look, Johnny, I'm here if you need me. Now, you know that's rhetoric. And a lot of people say it in life. And a lot of people say it and that's where it stops. What you have to do is to store it and to say to yourself, you know, I'm going to revisit this kid 
in whatever length of time that, uh, that I need to. You know, it could be a day, it could be a week. And you go back up to Johnny, and assuming Johnny doesn't, just doesn't take you up on the, on the offer of coming in uh, to see you or talking about it, you go up to Johnny and you say, hey, Johnny, Johnny, what's going on? How did things, how did things go with you when you're dead? What do you think Johnny thinks? Anyway. Somebody in this anonymous world really cares. Really cares. And so that is the immediate you know, positioning of trust right off the bat. Right off the bat. Okay? I grew up in New York City. Anonymous capital of the world. Truly. Truly. I got the idea for the programs and the work that I'm doing. I grew up in this apartment building where there was a thousand families. Now, imagine, that's enormous. Nobody knows each other. People shut the doors and it's, you know, you're, you, you, don't, you don't get too close to anybody in New York. You just, you know, there's a, a space and everybody, everybody just keeps the distance and the space. And you watch people walking down the street and it's like fishes swimming at one another. They just somehow find that little space to, to get between. Well, I was probably 12 years old and there was a woman, I used to carry her groceries. She lived down the hall from me. And I used to carry her groceries into the apartment building. She was probably in her 70s. Well, I learned that she died, and they didn't find her body until her rent was two months overdue. Now imagine being that alone in your life that the only thing that separates you from the outside world is the fact that your rent is overdue. That's the only thing. And I realize in this anonymity, people fall through the cracks. And kids who are in some cases powerless, they're caught in this economic, you know, kind of tug of war, where a parent says, either you do what I say or else, you know, or, or else, you know, you're in my house, you do it as I say, and that's it. That's where it stops. So kids feel that sense of being powerless. They have no ownership. For an adult to be able to give them some ownership in their lives is the most powerful thing you can give a kid. It's the most powerful thing you can give. Back to that, that situation in New York. Um, two days later, after the teacher got this, um, got this assignment, this young boy hung himself. Teacher got up in front of the whole school and threw and through um, through a tearful session, got up in front of the whole school and said, I will never look at a kid in the same way again. Now she told me in lengthy sessions, she said, I thought he had it all. I was having a tough, tough couple of days myself. I was going through a divorce. I had a lot of pain. <coughs> I came in, and I misjudged this kid. Now, obviously, you can continue to beat yourself up forever. And at some point, you have to forgive yourself and have to be kind to yourself and allow yourself an opportunity to have some errors in judgment. But what I'm discovering as I go around the country is that most parents and educators feel virtually inadequate around what to do with an at-risk kid. What do you do when you spot a kid who's at risk? Now, I have parents that come up to me every day, and they tell me horror stories about the at-risk kid. Now, I am committed. I am committed to this at-risk situation for probably the balance of my career. About a year and a half ago, a friend of mine sent her 11-year-old son up to his room to clean up his room, and he put a plastic bag over his head and killed himself. She never saw the signs. He was giving cries for help. She never saw the signs. She's been institutionalized ever since. I was driving away from her house, and I realized how many people out there were in this situation, how many parents go to bed at night or send their kids off to school or send them out of the house and absolutely panic with the possibility that they may not come back or they may come back you know, in, in some type of broken state. 
I got the Michigan Optimists and 4-H to partner in a center for the prevention of youth at risk. It happens to be located here in, over in Novi on 60 acres of property. They're in the process now of a $25 million campaign. They have a conference center up. They're going to have telecommunications. It will be a nationwide center designed to build up the level of awareness of people in communities around the at-risk kid. Around the at-risk kid. Now, obviously, suicide is only one of probably a dozen at-risk situations. And I asked the question in my assembly with kids, how many, how many kids come from divorced families? Now, I consider divorce to be one of the biggest at-risk situations today. When I speak in Michigan, I am probably looking at, I have never had a school with less than 50%, I am probably looking at 60-70% of the kids who come from divorced families. When I speak in California, which is where I was last month, you virtually have to count hands in a room. And it was never meant to show figures, by the way. It was only meant to show that we don't know each other before we get married. You can virtually count hands in a room of kids who don't come from divorced families. You're looking at 80, 90 percent in most schools. Now, obviously, it's a breakdown of the support base of a kid. Okay? Now, to me, probably, again, the divorce is so prime that it makes almost every kid at risk. But the five key at-risk situations are teen suicide, teen pregnancy, dropout rate, teen violence, and drug abuse. Now, this starts early. It starts early. Okay. I asked Glenn Kraft, a, a young man who I met at an alternative school. He lives in Rochester, fairly affluent family. I asked him, he's been doing some work with me. We did a half an hour special on Channel 2 last night on the at-risk kid. I asked him to come today to talk about what he, is, what he has dealt with since seventh grade in his life, where he's been and what he is you know, the, the pain that he's been dealing with and what he needs to do to get through it. So I'd like to introduce Glenn now. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, actually, I'm going to go a little uh, earlier than seventh grade. Uh, I moved about mid-sixth grade, uh, pretty much towards the end, from uh, Kansas. I've been there about 10 years. Didn't, of course, you know, as every new student, didn't fit in. <coughs> so I spent most of my time for the rest of that year by myself. And uh, seventh grade, I went to the big junior high and series like this. Um, started meeting some older people, uh, little crowds in public school and public school, and uh, drinking at this time in school. So uh, I just I tried it once. In my seventh grade year, the only thing that really happened was major the drop in grades. Uh, didn't really get too heavy into the alcohol until the summer between seventh and eighth. And uh, that got into pretty much what we used. Um, by the time the eighth grade rolled around, I was drinking between probably up to five and fifths and stuff to comfort me. And uh, going to get up and get in the shower. And it's beyond, I don't know, it's beyond me not knowing ever knew in school. Um, built up quite a tolerance uh, very quickly. But, uh, it's, you know, the smell must have just been, you know, separate. Yeah, um, so that, my grades dropped real bad. <laughs> <coughs> I was in with the right crowd now, you know, nothing else matter. Um, family life began to deteriorate. Never. My, my family is like the quiet, dysfunctional type. Uh, my dad never really, um, you know, he was never out in, in the bars and all that, but he just, he was home and kind of off to himself. He never really spent much time with the kids and uh, never could share. You know, it's from the old school, as people say. Um, and my mom and I were very close. And uh, about this 
time, our relationship, relations with the family just broke up. I was out on my own. And uh, they always had the philosophy that, you know, you let them go, let them have some freedom, you know, you know uh, do well with it. Well, in my case, I, I took it to the limit. Uh, okay, so I was getting into very heavy drinking for about a year or so. And uh, it started to scare me. I knew I could put any of my friends, you know, whether they're three or four years old, on the table. And, uh, and I knew that I, how I felt when I didn't drink in a day was, you know, I didn't like that. So I decided I'd, I'd stop that. And uh, I got this fucking high. And uh, this was before we moved up to um, high school, the summer before that. And that turned into every day. So I just replaced, uh, replaced them. And uh, all along, I think. High, there was maybe one teacher that had a little bit of, this, of a suspicion. And uh, she later caught up with me in high school because she lived up to high school. Um, but so I, I went on my merry old way and uh, got in a very heavy uh, uh, use of pot with a long without call sometimes, uh, which is something I would never do. So I, I got admitted to ACE, it's an alternative side of education, and uh, it's a small, much smaller structure. It's uh, a limit of 20 kids per class, per grade, and uh, four teachers, and uh, got a social worker that comes in two days on a week, and a uh, principal. And uh, it's more like a family uh, foundation. Uh, I know how hard it must be, uh, especially at the high school. This is it's much more um, individual based. And, uh, so I, I started to straighten out a bit. At least I got up to honor roll on grades because of the teachers. <laughs> and uh, but my my drug and alcohol was still still there, was waiting for me. Uh, it wasn't as bad uh, but it was a good turn because uh, <coughs> I started to learn how expensive all this was I was doing this past and how uh, profitable it was to sell drugs. And uh, so I found my way into that and uh, just started out pretty slowly. And of course, no one would expect me, you know, other than I have some long, straggly hair, I'm the you know, perfect kid. Uh, may not always, you know, be proper in class, but everybody, you know, I was a kid that everybody liked. Uh, I could fool anybody, I fooled myself. Five years. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, about middle of tenth grade, I uh, tried my first day of acid.
So, 11th grade, I went in the year uh, the honor roll gave me my mother apartment. And I've never been a person who will actually exert any effort. If I can do something, which I usually can do, and you know, get good results, that's fine, but I'm not gonna really put a lot into it. So uh, that's how I looked at 11th grade. And uh, that went down to you know, really quickly. Uh, but the, the attitude was a great change. Like, oh, you're not gonna let me sit at home? I think you're not gonna let me Which hurt me, obviously. But uh, my grades slipped down to C, D, again, going down again. And um, I started selling that. always wants to give me a break wherever I go, so I, I got a nice uh, looking job, desk job. Um, and that was, uh, pretty well paid, so I was able to get all my drugs. And uh, still selling them. And, uh, I don't know, it all kind of came to an end in about two week period. I, uh, my parents went up to Traverse City.
best thing you can do is show some interest in the students. Uh, I have a very dear friend, uh, my math teacher from the Alternative Center, uh, who I see regularly just once a week. Um, she never knew, but uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. I just she was the only one. The school is, like I said, it's a smaller uh, environment and it can get more personal. But she was the only one that I really thought cared. And uh, she really tried to, she helped me out in some, uh, some tough situations. And uh, just like uh, you were saying, the 30 minute, 30 minute, 30 minute, 30 second uh, counsel. Um, just saying, you know, you know, you know, if someone is having a hard time and you just happen to see them in the hall and later on that week, say, how's that situation? That means to this, to me, you know, wow, someone, someone does care, and uh, that's a big deal. And even if you can just say, hey, you don't need to talk, and nothing else, because they're not going to talk to you right there. But if you put that out to them, and then they think, oh, you know, maybe I'll try that out, uh, prove it wrong. <laughs> so, um, you know, just whatever you can do, it's hard to spot. Stereotypes uh, <laughs> The math teacher that he referred to gave him a major turn. It's a woman that I know, and she's very much. Focused and sensitive to kids' needs. All of you in the room, myself included in this, we all in, got involved in, in this profession to deal with kids in the beginning because there was a part of us that wanted to make a difference. For many of us, and I get burned out too, you've got your own survival at stake. I'm pleased to hear that you've got a support base in this school. I think it's absolutely <coughs> crucial. I think it's 100% it's, it's crucial. Teachers, for whatever reason, and people in education have been maligned over the years. Um, there's a, a friend of mine, Hanuk McCarty, who does in services around the country, and he, he tells the story about um, having gone to a party with a woman that he was dating, and she was a teacher. And uh, they walked into the party, and uh, they were introducing themselves to the host and hostess. And uh, someone said, now, asked his date, now, what do you do? And she says, I'm a teacher. Just like that. <laughs> I'm a teacher. And he says that that's how some people perceive it. Now, it's crucial that all of you get a support base. But every New Year's, I do something to renew my commitment in terms of kids and in terms of what I see as my purpose, a big part of my purpose to my life. I'd like to do a small exercise with you for about five minutes, and then we'll take a few minute break and come back. And then what I'd like to do in the remaining time that I have left is not to deal with the problem or the rhetoric or the surrounding things. I'd like to get to the nuts and bolts. Um, I threw out my notes. I threw out my whole teacher in service. Um, I'm committed to getting to you know, some specific action issues for you in this school. Now, I live in Royal Oak. The center is in Novi. I'm committed, if any of you in this room want, to helping you work together to make an action plan happen to alleviate some of the problems that you're dealing with around the at-risk kid. Because it's got to be a strain for some of you. You spot kids and you don't know what to do, you don't know what resources are out there, you don't know what the chain is to work through, and this is crucial in being able to take a kid from step one to some type of completion where they can get some help. So there's some three by five cards on, on, the, on, the, uh, um, on the tables. And I'd like to ask everyone if you could to help me out on an exercise. I do this every New Year's Eve. And I've been doing this the last five years. All I've been doing this the last five years. And it, I have it 
on my on my mirror at my house. I'd like all of you on the three by five card, and this is personal, okay? I'd like all of you on the three by five card to uh, to put the year of your birth. Put the year the year of your birth. Now, for the men in the room, um, add seventy seven years to that year and pick an imaginary day. So, assuming it's 77 years, and then pick, you know, February 15th for the women. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, reverse it. For the men, pick 73 years, and for the women, pick 77 years, and put a day in that year. Okay? So, first is the year of your birth. Men 73 years, women 77 years, and pick an imaginary day that year. Okay? Now, given statistics the way they are, this is considered to be the last day of your life. Okay? Underneath that, underneath that, um, I'd like you to write in one sentence or less um, how you'd like to be remembered. I know, I just going to say is you have to be in a complete sentence. This is not a good sign. <laughs> Below that sentence, if you're still continuing to write, below that sentence, in one sentence or less, or fragments, <laughs> <coughs> how you perceive people see you now. Wow. I can do your shit. of this is if the first and second don't match what in your mind do you need to do to help them get closer together As I said, every New Year's I do this. Every New Year's I make a renewed commitment because I see my purpose as being able to give kids a voice in life. And every year I renew that in some way and then try and look at whether I'm on target or not. Um, it's very fragile. My whole premise of the concept of how I live is that it is fragile and that we just don't know. And we don't know how much time we've got left. And I think if somehow magically when we were born, if everyone was given a date of the last day that they had on this earth, our whole lives would change. And many of the things that we take that are important and we think are, are monumental would somehow diminish with that concept. I'd like all of you, in some fashion, to keep this 3 by 5 card and put it in a prominent place where you might be reminded on somehow day-to-day, week-to-week basis of how fragile it is out there and that 
what your goals and dreams are, you know, are real, and how you can make them happen. Can we take a probably five minute break? I'd really appreciate that. Within this plan, you can deal with the at-risk kid. There are some communities, and I just returned from one in Minnesota, there are some communities that what they are doing as part of their year plan is that they are training teachers. They bring in an expert in teen suicide, teen pregnancy, dropout rate, teen violence, and drug abuse, depending upon the problems in the community. They could be all, they could be three, they could be four, they could be one. They bring in an expert who then in turn, you know, gives them the prevention techniques, the awareness, and then what to do. Many of you have gone through such training programs. Rana mentioned to me during the break that um, many of you have gone through some substance abuse training programs. However, again, all the other at-risk situations are out there. I urge all of you to be able to look at this plan, build in your own needs. That's the crucial thing for most of us in our lives. I spent my life denying my own needs. And when someone asked me what did I need, I was more, so much of a people pleaser that I told them what I thought they wanted me to say. I believe in my heart that we're all on this earth to fulfill our own needs. Now, that may sound self-centered, a self-centered statement, but when I first heard it, I was questioned. I questioned the person who, who said it. And then the more I thought, I realized that that is really true. I mean, for instance, Mother Teresa is on this earth to fulfill her need to serve. Okay? Lee Iacocca is on this earth to fulfill his need for power. I mean, this is, you know, this is the, the, the dynamic of it. So all of you in this room have some needs. And I think it's absolutely crucial if you are in a supportive environment for every one of you to be able to have a voice around your needs. Now that is not to say that you'll ever get your needs met, but the idea that you have the opportunity and the freedom to be able to express that is so crucial. I do not see that in schools around the country. I don't. I see it squelched by administration. I see it squelched by community. I see no parent involvement. And I think that it can change. Schools are becoming, for many cases, a battleground. I did a middle school uh, in California in November, and I walked into the bathroom, and there was a 10-year-old boy or 9-year-old boy doing a line of coke on the sink. This was an affluent community. I grabbed this kid, I took him in to the principal. Um, I'm sure they reprimanded him, I'm sure they brought in his parents, I'm sure that they did the whole progression. However, it was the tip of the iceberg. As I found out later, there is one kid in the school who is 10 or 11 years old that is the major supplier. It can happen. <clears throat> it's out of control in some cases. The only way to stop that is for a unified effort on all of your parts. And if you cannot do it for necessarily for, for your involvement with the kids, do it for yourselves. Because eventually what's happening in schools is that teachers, if they are not already there, are becoming more of a disciplinarian than a teacher. And this in turn, is changing the whole focus of education. And education is fighting this. They're fighting, they're, they're fighting, they're moving up, you know, pushing it upstream and saying, no, we still want to teach. But it's happening. <coughs> you guys can curb it. The self-esteem task force is absolutely crucial. It, it can change the whole climate in this school. It can focus on a whole, on a whole new set of dynamics and goals. Now, many of you, you know, are saying, wow, you know, I just don't need another thing to do. I can't deal with this. 
Many of you are bringing your own personal issues to school, and that's a struggle. I can tell you in the communities that have developed this that basically it has helped alleviate more than add to the burden of a teacher. I can tell you this unequivocally. The communities that, that have gone back, you know, two and three and four years later, that have that year-long plan together. Now, that year-long plan should consist of input from pretty much, in this school, because of the size of the school, pretty much all of you. In some way, you should give input to that plan. And that's a blueprint that can be changed, that can be, you know, that, that, that can be modified, but it is a blueprint to work from. And every year, in some fashion, for all of you to get a little bit more of your needs met, you need to have continued input into that plan. This can work. I am absolutely convinced. And there are many of you in the room who are saying, not here, not now, not in this circumstances, not with this administration. I am telling you, it can work. It is the hope of the potential of the future. If we go along now, see, we're a reaction-based society, okay? Problems get hot, you know, blaring headlines, you know, five kids kill themselves, everybody rushes into school, takes the hoses, puts out the fire, you know, something else crops up two, three, four days later. No one, no one, no one looks at prevention, you know, on a, on a positive way because we're so busy trying to survive around the reaction mode that we can't get in the prevention mode. It's crucial to be able to step back, no matter how bad the reaction is, and start to look at the prevention aspect of this. It's got to happen. I am committed. I am committed. I will come out here. I will come out here free of charge. I will come out here, you know, as many times as my schedule will permit. If you guys are willing to work towards building the self-esteem task force, if you are willing to, you know, to, to look at, you know, the potential of how to deal with the at-risk kid. I am willing to sit down with you on as many hours as it will take to make this happen. I will go anywhere now, anywhere in this country, as a matter of fact, all over the world, because I feel the at-risk kid is the kid that's going to beat down education. It's going to beat down education. I will help any of you. You can call me literally day and night, and I'll find a way to get back to you. I keep a grueling schedule, but that center was a dream of mine. It was a dream to see happen, and now it's finally underway. We are going to have, and I would invite you to participate, we are going to have quarterly, we had our first one at the Wyndham Hotel, now the center is pretty much into completion, we had our first training program at the Wyndham Hotel. Ten communities, five people from every community participated in that training session. Over the course of the weekend, they dealt with everything from gang wars or from gangs all the way down to AIDS, to substance abuse, to a lot of the things that kids are dealing with. And they brought in experts. And it was an intensive three-day program. We are encouraging people from literally all over the state to come in in teams of four and five people, to go back into the community as a team, to work collectively in that supportive environment as the team, to make some changes in the community, to raise the level of awareness. In this room, many of you are parents. If you believe in your heart that it won't happen to your kids, then you are fooling yourself. If you don't do it as a teacher, do it as a parent. I am telling you, it's there. It's there. And I'm scared. I'm really scared. Because you see, when I was growing up, suicide was the furthest option. Now, I see suicide almost every, every time I speak, I hear between 50 and 75 open admissions of suicide. It's there. It's a way of life. It's happening. Kids are willing to take their own life over a grade, a breakup of a relationship, something. I'd like to share with you before you go what I consider to be the hope. I got a letter 
several weeks ago from a young girl and she basically gave me an opportunity to have some hope that, that maybe, maybe we can turn this sucker around. Bear with me for one second, I will to find that letter. <laughs> This young girl is the daughter of one of the vice presidents of Ford Motor Company. So basically, again, on paper, she looks like she's got it all. Jim, I want to do something wonderful for you because you deserve so much, but I don't know what to do. I guess the best thing I can do is to tell you what's honestly on my mind. I feel guilty because I tried to kill myself. You're my friend and I feel like I did something to defeat your purpose. Suicide is weak. I always thought that. I thought it while I was taking the pills. At the moment, I didn't care. I wanted to disappear. Now, I have never, ever, in any of my work, heard it put more powerfully than this. I didn't realize that death and disappearance are not the same thing. I didn't realize that death and disappearance are not the same thing. I'd forgotten how great it feels to laugh so hard that you almost wet your pants and looking at a sunset over the lake with wind in my hair or to love something so much I feared my insides would bust. I forgot how to love myself, the only thing I have on this earth and will ever have. I was blind to the beauty of myself. I'm not anymore. I am beautiful. I have a lot to give. This is the hope. This is the turn. This is the possibility. Every one of you in this room can turn a kid. Turn them either way. Every one of you in this room, if you sat down and thought about it in your history, you remember the teachers in your life. You either remember the teachers who uplifted you or destroyed you. And many of you can draw back 25, 30 years to the exact moment a teacher destroyed you. Many of those teachers didn't mean to destroy you. They were so involved in their own lives so so much in turmoil that they just didn't know what they were doing and they were insensitive. That's why the support for all of you needs to be there first in order for you to be supportive in your life. You cannot give what you don't have. I in turn belong to two support groups in my life. I plan my schedule which is grueling around these support groups. And I make sure that there are some weeks when I need support and I ask openly without embarrassment, and some weeks when I'm feeling stronger and I can give support. But my scars are still there. I've grown up with a lot of pain. I've kept people away because I was too scared. I never wanted anybody to get close because they were going to reject me. And in rejecting me, they would destroy me. And so I was never able to open up and ask for help. And I spent my whole life virtually alone. And the walls, as each year I went, they kept getting higher and higher. And I kept putting another brick up until finally the wall got up so high that nobody got through. And men notoriously have a tough time in terms of sharing their feelings. And so I had a double whammy there. It's possible. This is the turn, but everybody needs support at every level. I urge all of you to create the blueprint. I urge all of you to look at the self-esteem task force. I urge all of you to get your needs heard, if not in some cases met. That's the crucial thing. That's the balance. That's what will help you, what you put on the three by five card, how you want to be remembered. That will help you get closer to them. Could you possibly just maybe say what you mean about that? Yeah. Um, I was just saying that after my, I don't think it's our crime. Uh, after my three years at working in bad seats with uh, criminal kids that I, and being a special ed teacher, that I believe that I can't reach a kid academically if I reach them effectively. And I, I wonder why I'm seeing if they're trying to teach English and what I need to do is to teach them to care about themselves. So. 
I, I need to I yeah. need to thank you from my heart on not only on the exchange, but there was a key point in the exchange when you talked about the opportunity for you to be vulnerable. And uh, the gentleman who was here, I need to if if he if you see him, you know, that was very powerful for him to allow himself to, to feel in front of him and uh, a major statement, you know, for his ability to be vulnerable. I found something, I was reading this last night, it's an old book, it's called The Learning Community, but in it was, was something, it said, finally I believe that teachers who become sensitive to their own feelings and emotions would be able to encourage children to explore the conflicts which they feel. This does not take expert knowledge. The key behavior is listening and responding with understanding. It is my understanding that children who experience such a teacher would themselves become more alive. They would maintain awareness of their feelings and emotions and they would they would come to understand what they mean to themselves and others. This would increase their self-understanding and their ability to make choices which were beneficial to their own development. Some of the conflicts between, between personal worth and ability to cope might be resolved. I am committed to helping you guys make this happen. I was one of the kids at risk, still live at risk, still live with the pain, still live with the scars, still live with the fears. Whatever it takes, I will help you guys out. Thank you. Thank you.